love welcome. Welcome to Juice Guru Radio. Discover what the magic and power of juicing can do for you. And now, your host, best-selling author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Juice Fasting, Steve Prusak. And welcome, welcome. It's Got Mucus, Discover the Healing Power of the Mucus-Free Lifestyle. I'm going to be interviewing Professor Spira, and I'm Steve Prusak, Juice Guru. Thank you for being here. This is going to be phenomenal. I've been excited since we booked him, and I've been a fan of his work since I tapped into it. And really what I love about, there's so many things I love about this guy. Not, a, not only that he's super cool, a uh, jazz musician and, and, and scholastic and educator and just presents the material in a way that's just like Dr. Arnold or Professor Arnold Errett, who really was one of my inspirations 26 years ago when I took this journey. Uh, if you've read the Mucus, Mucus's Diet Healing System or Rational Fasting, they sit on my shelf. And when I wrote my books, they were like, they served as such inspiration. And when I came across Professor Spira and saw the way he's carrying on the message, a message that would be lost, because I know a lot of my friends never heard of Arnold Errett. Um, and, you know, that book came out in the 1920s. We're going to hear all about that and so much more on this episode. So I, I could, actually, I couldn't be more excited to have him. I'm going to actually present him in a more formal way, but thank you again for being here. This is going to be, I don't know, I'm like a fanboy. Seriously, it's, it's, it's going to be incredible. And again, this episode is brought to you by Juicing for Rapid Weight Loss at juicingwithsteve.com. And our friends at Mucus Free Life, Professor Spira, uh, www.mucusfreelife.com. We're going to tell you all about what he's got going on there and how you can go deeper with all this stuff like I personally am. I'm actually going deep with, with what Professor Spear is teaching. He's an author, I said, a musician, uh, he, uh, a university lecturer, founder of Mucus Free Life, LLC, and one of the most sought-after experts on Arnold Errett's mucusless diet healing system. He's, I mean, I haven't seen anyone taking Arnold's work to the level that Professor Spear is, and he has been doing it for a long time now. He lives the life, and he educates based on heart center, not making money. It's not about the supplements or the latest fat or BS diet. We talk about that all the time. He's the real deal. And so I respect the work he's doing. He's got seven books on natural health, including the annotated and edited version of Arnold Errett's Mucus's Diet Healing System, where he's gone in and he's really clarified. He brought it up to the new age, we can say, with the recipes he's got in there. Uh, it, a lot of the stuff Arnold had was outdated for this day and age. And also about just understanding the text. And you're going to get a good glimpse of that right here on this interview because I'm going to take him deep into this because I know he lives it. It's his passion. It's my passion too. And his other books, he's got uh, the lifestyle book. It's not a diet book. It's Spira Speaks, Dialogues and Essays on the Mucusless Diet Healing System. And that was the first book I found. Uh, I think I downloaded it on my Kindle. And I was like, wow, who, who is this? Let me, I want to go deeper with this stuff. There's nothing new. Let's bring him on the show right now so you could get to know him too because I'm already the fanboy. Professor Spira, are you here with us? I'm here. Thank you for joining. I'm sorry if I was, you know, uh, you know, it's like having, um, you know, maybe it's like having Paul McCartney on if you're a Beatle fan. I say that as a joke. <laughs> but hey, I just truly appreciate that. It's it's overwhelming, uh, especially coming after we just had the Eric Day celebration, as you know, we'll talk about, and uh, and just the love that I was getting there and getting all this love from you. I'm just I'm just super happy right now. And I know because people on my email list wrote back, they're like, yeah, you know, that's the first book I read 50 years ago. And this is great that you're bringing this information to this audience. And, and I'll tell you, a lot of people in my audience have no idea what this is, what we mean by any of this. So for, let's start with you, though, and your story and how you got involved and first learned about this all those years back. So growing up, I was always tended to be overweight. Then as I got a bit older and into my teenage years, I got uh, fairly sturdy. I was about 240 pounds and probably 5'10 or so uh, for a while. And the only reason that people didn't think that this was something that was just totally horrible was one, they didn't know how sick I was. I was constantly, almost every day of the year, I had a box of tissues and I was blowing my nose all day. Uh, bad, you know, they said I had allergies. So I was on pharmaceutical medication since seven years old. Uh, the Seldane, which they took off the market after it killed people. Then Allegra and Zyrtec, I, Claritin, I did all of them. And I just thought that that was my inheritance. I thought that that's what I was going to be, what my life was going to be like, because I had a very sick mother 
and my mother died when I was in the sixth grade. Two years before that, I lost my, uh, my grandmother who had raised me. And so, you know, grandmother dies two years later, my mom dies. Uh, but it was even worse than that. Cause my mom really, she, all my life, she had been really sick. She ended up having both her legs amputated and, uh, a week after my grandma passed away, my mom had, uh, uh, had a heart attack and then had double bypass surgery and she never returned home after that. So she was in nursing homes and hospitals those last couple of years. And my aunt was my guardian, took care of me. And she always made sure to take me down to the nursing homes, wherever my mom was at to visit her. And so when a lot of my friends were happy, go lucky playing and running around, you know, I was spending a lot more time than, I maybe would have wanted to at that age in hospitals and nursing homes. And so at a young age, I got a chance to see something that a lot of people don't see that they don't promote on TV. <laughs> they don't show you the, this environment, these kind of environments oftentimes. And I even, st I even started to develop relationships with some of the other folks. Cause a lot of the, the older people that were in these facilities they didn't have any, they didn't see young people and they didn't have a lot of family come and visit them. And so they were real lonely. And so I kind of just, I would befriend them and they befriend me. And then that was sad when one of them would pass away. And, uh, and so after all of that, I, you know, went through high school and was foot, football player. So I was working out all the time, but uh, music was my first love. So was musician and I did a bunch of other stuff, was in Boy Scouts. And I, I, it was kind of my way of dealing with that tragedy was to dive into all my activities. So they say a lot of times when young people have a tough upbringing in terms of losing a loved one, sometimes they'll become problem childs and going off in that direction. Other times they become sort of overachievers and just do everything. And that was my thing. I just did it. I did. I kind of consumed myself with so much stuff that I didn't, I didn't even grieve. I mean, I, it, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I grieved a couple of years ago, you know, that was part of, uh, and that, which was part of an elimination and a fasting process. But uh, so after all that, mm -hmm. I end up deciding to go to uh, when it's time for college, I decided to go to the college conservatory of music and pursue a life of as a professional musician as that was the one thing that was constant throughout my whole life was I was always interested in playing music even though when I was really young I just kind of I had a little keyboard and little stuff and I would just make my own stuff up and just kind of uh, teach myself how to do things and so I had this kind of improvisational approach and then when I started to learn more formal training I was able to maintain this improvisational kind of spirit that I had developed over years as a young person. Uh, and then, you know, get the, get the formal stuff that you need to really learn how to play the instrument and everything. And uh, so, yeah, once I got, got into college conservatory, I actually, I got into college conservatory, music, I uh, also got into Berkeley, got into a couple other schools, but I wanted to go to CCMs. I had some friends there. I liked, uh, being uh, at school close and kind of local to where I was growing up. And so I wasn't you know, relocating out of state. And so when I started at CCM, I, around that time is when I met uh, Willie Smart, AKA brother air who introduced me to the mucus diet healing system. And by that time, that first year of college, I gained probably almost 50, 60 pounds. And to the point where by the time I, really started looking into the mucus diet I was almost 300 pounds and it was getting bad because I wasn't working out anymore I was no longer a varsity athlete and so I, all I did all day was eat and practice and study to, to keep up with the academics at CCM but uh, I when I first met brother air he didn't tell me about the diet yet uh, we just talked about music and he kind of gave me some support as you know, being someone in the school environment that, you know, I, one of what my, <laughs> my PhD and, and those academic studies are in uh, racial dynamics within uh, jazz education. 
And so he kind of was this support system saying, you're already in the fraternity of, of jazz musicians. You're already a part of this. So you don't have to try to, you know, bend over backwards to fit into their, whatever their thing is. And so that really helped me out that kind of that idea of this, this is, this is my music. It kind of just changed my mind to the point where when I'm in school, instead of trying to be of service to the educators, it's like, no, wait a minute, I'm paying you guys. So let's, let, let's, let's put this into proper perspective. And, and, uh, and so I got, uh, as I, once I eventually got into the mucus's diet, that allowed me to get deeper into my studies as I was so much clearer so I could study and understand things uh, a lot better. But, uh, but before we get to that, ultimately, after a, I knew Brother Air for about nine months, he finally t- had to tell me about the mucus's diet. There's this is the famous story. We we're at the jam, this jam session in Shea Nora uh, in uh, northern Kentucky, and it, we were at uh, a break, and me and my friend Ryan Wells were sitting there, and they had all this spread of food, free food, and so I had this plate of all this chicken wings and all this stuff, and I'm sitting there eating this stuff, and Brother Air's sitting across just giving us this look like he just can't hold his tongue any longer and he starts talking about diet and the mucus's diet and over the course of that conversation my arm just got slower and slower to the point that I'm just kind of staring down at this plate like oh okay (laughs) and so uh, yeah and it was after that I started practicing the diet you know went and got the mucus's diet book and read it and it blew. I already knew it was going to change my life just based on the way that brother Eric had set up, set it up. I was like, wow, this is, this is what I'd been looking for. Cause I had been looking for something to answer a lot of the questions that I had about why is the world the way it is? Why are things so bad? What, why, what is all this, all this suffering? Is there a reason for it more so than, there's so many answers to that in all kinds of different religions, all kinds of different philosophers and different traditions. I I had studied a lot of them, probably most of them. And I wasn't satisfied with any of those answers. The mucus's diet opened me up to answers that I was comfortable with that I had been looking for. I said, this makes sense. Humanity, humanity, getting divorced from nature, and that being a reason, we losing who we are because we're getting away from our natural diet. That makes sense. Why, of course, we're going to act insane and crazy and have all of this myriad of different ways to be insane because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're out of balance. And so that was the message that I got when I started really studying you can just diet book and practicing as I started practicing the diet. And that was, <laughs> that was it. At that point, I, I just started going down that path and said, this is, this is it for me. You know, I, I found what I was looking for. So for clarity, brother air, he's been practicing, was it 40 years? Is it now? Is it 45 years now? Yeah, so he, or, or yeah, no, yeah. 40 years. Yeah. Cause he started around you know, 1980. And how many years have you been practicing it as a practitioner? 16, either 16 or 17. I always said we're, <laughs> we're getting close to the fall. So I have to add another number every, every <laughs> once we get to the fall. But uh, yeah, it's been, uh, yeah, at least 16 years. Uh, probably think coming up on 17 here. And uh, yeah. The thing that, I mean, there's so many things that excite me about this because we always, there was this meme I put up a few months ago about the simplicity of truth. Like there's nothing more simple than truth. And the way Arnold Eret wrote, like you talk about, he is a philosopher and he was a scientist and he combined it all. And you read the work and the way you interpret it too, to bring it more up to date. And it's just so logical, like rationale fasting. It's also rational. And yet, you know, we have a lot of people in the health world that are overcomplicating things that are debating this fad diet versus this fad diet that are even in the vegan movement overcomplicating things where one vegan doctor is going after another and this and that. 
And it's almost like a breath of fresh air when you see all this chaos out there, isn't it? We've been actually, we have doctors out there, vegan doctors, saying juicing isn't healthy. And I know Brother Eric no. couldn't believe that either. <laughs> yeah, that was in the conversation that we had had. But I had to, I had to explain to Brother Eric what, what we were even talking about he's like w- w- hold on what juicing isn't healthy he just couldn't even conceive of- yeah, he's like and a doctor would say that a vegan doctor would say that juicing is not good how how is that even possible right 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 and so i guess the question here is about the simplicity in the teaching like for the people that are here and new to it some people are haven't even don't actually even know what this is and Hmm. And the transition that you talk about, and mm-hmm. and and also we could touch on the different movements, the raw food movement, and the vegan movement, the vegetarian movement, the paleo diet, and and if you can combine that all, and then we can get into the death culture after that, because I have so much I want to talk to you about. Okay, so just kind of a summary of the mucus diet a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, by so- the way, I should mention if you guys really want to go deeper, his podcast is amazing. I've heard every one of them. He's got eight of them now. And uh, they're long. They're about an hour and a half, two hours. And I just, I have it on in the gym and I just listen to it and soak it up and love it. So, um, and so it's all down on the website though. And again, I, I mentioned the website. We're going to have it up in the show notes at juicegrowradio.com. And I'll put it here in the chat for the, um, for mucusfreelife.com. And you can find out all about the things he's up to there. Check out the podcast, his books and the e-course, which we'll talk about that I'm enrolled in. And we'll talk about that later. Okay. So, let's get back to it yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to just summarize the mucus diet healing system it is a transitional methodology to take you from wherever you are now in terms of your diet no matter if you're more advanced or you're still eating mcdonald's and burger king and fast food to take you wherever you are and learn how to mechanically and systematically transition toward a mucus free diet And a mucus-free diet is one where you're eating foods that do not degrade into slime inside of the body. So foods that create slime in the body are the worst offenders are meat and dairy. As a lot of even people that have no nothing, know nothing about the diet, they'll name that first. They say, well, dairy, yes, causes mucus, but meat and dairy, we call that pus forming foods because they're blood born the the tissue sort of it, it when it degrades it turns into this very viscous concentrated form of mucus that we uh, we give that term pus then things like uh, breads the your grains and starches they're not as uh, not as bad but they are mucus forming so if you think of something like white bread if you were to take some bread and you you put it in some water, you know, just in a thing of water, some bread, and let it sit there for a couple hours. Then maybe take a handful of grapes and squeeze them and put that into another thing of water and let those sit for two hours. Which one of those would you like to drink the water out of? Uh, the one that had the grapes or the one that had the, this, this bread? That bread is going to turn into this just glop of slime. And so when we talk about mucus forming foods, we're talking about these foods that leave behind this slimy residue. They don't burn clean away like fruit does uh, in our bodies. And there's a lot of confusion that people have uh, when we say mucus forming and they think that we're talking about anything that causes you to blow your nose. That's there's a misunderstanding of mechanics here because there's a difference between mucus forming foods and a lymphatic response to stimuli when you're putting something in because you can get a response if you drink some some lemon water or lime water depending on how encumbered you are you it might trigger in a we call it an, an elimination is be a probably a good thing where you blow in your nose and stuff that lime juice didn't create mucus it, and if anything it helped loosen it and helped uh, to promote lymphatic elimination, to, to squeeze that stuff out, secrete that stuff out. So there, there's a little more to it than, than that, but this, the easiest way to just think about it is you don't you want to avoid foods that just turn into slime. But 
the sophistication and I think the one of the best aspects of Eret's system is the transitional di- dynamic. And so with the transition, you are able to, uh, uh, we're, we're not saying that you have to be mucus free overnight or in a couple days or even a couple years. There's a systematic approach that you want to apply so that over the course of time, you transform your body and your physiology. And as you transform it, you lose the desire for these foods that you used to really crave, the ones that are causing the most harm and being the most obstructive. Because that's what Eric says, uh, uh, most importantly, is he offers us this theory of vitality equals power minus obstruction. What that means is if you remove the obstruction, Say you go out to your car, and if you put a bunch of sand in the engine of your car, how is it going to function properly? Probably not, because there's obstruction. Something is preventing the engine from moving properly. There's foreign matter in the engine. Well, in the case of the body, foreign matter is uneliminated food substances of mucus and pus-forming foods that ultimately uh, accumulate in the body, uh, then the body's lymphatic system doesn't eliminate properly. and You get a body that is just overcome with uneliminated waste products the, because the kidney can't, can, can't get rid of it. The, your pores or your skin can't get rid of it and you can't get rid of it in your bowels. So it's going to stay in there and the body's going to try to do whatever it can to Uh, get that stuff away from your vital organs and just, okay, let's put it over here for a while and try to encase it in some fat or whatever and whatever. And, uh, and so, so, I mean, well, you should mention that most people are carrying this around. Like how many pounds of this are they carrying around? Yeah. So the average person has pounds and pounds of uneliminated fecal matter in their bowels. Eric said 10 pounds to 15. That was back in the 1920s. Today, we got people with 20, 30, 40 pounds of uneliminated fecal matter walking around in their stomachs. And, you know, the, the, <laughs> as most people know, the, uh, uh, the intestine is 32 feet, the full intestine, the whole GI tract. And that entire intestine, if it's backed up, People think they're doing something good. They have one bowel movement a day or, you know, or, and then I, I've worked with a lot of people. That always blows my mind because uh, where people go days without bowel movements. I mean, that's just, uh, yeah, that's, that's really rough. And even though I did used to be like that uh, back in the day, it's hard for me to even conceive of that now. But 32 feet of impacted intestines and not only impacted intestines because it's not impacted with, fruits and vegetables it's impacted with all of this lovely stuff that we're seeing on on here the fast food and the the meat and the dairy and all this kind of stuff and if you're listening to the podcast we are looking at slides of fast food and just i you know these are disturbing for some people i know but what we're trying to get to here though is first of all to suspend everything you know about health if you could put everything you know about health on pause right now everything that you, you know, thought was the way it should be. Cause I, I mean, Professor Spears, he spoke, we, we all have interviewed nutritionists, doctors, and it's not cut and dry the way we've been conditioned to believe. Even when you were talking before about how mucus comes out when we have a flu or a cold and most people take medicine to stop that, not realizing the body is detoxing. You realize that as a culture, we've got it all wrong. Isn't that right, Dr. Uh, Professor Spira? Most definitely. Most definitely. It's on my podcast, yeah, I have the, the Bizarro World headline news. We often I say love that. Bizarro World when we talk about the world, the, the pus and mucus inspired world because everything is backward. It makes no sense. There's, it's devoid of logic. You know, they've created their own logics on bad theories. And so you take something like a, like a protein theory that uh, was developed in the 1800s, and you, even though it's changed over the years, that initial idea is the word protein, meaning first principle, first protein principle, 
even though the, the original theoretical framework as laid out by Francois Magendi and Mulder and these guys that kind of coined the term and the idea, the, the, it's changed since then. But still, people still treat that protein like, like that. And, and we're fed upon that because the, uh, uh, the, it's, it's been presented to us like that for sales purposes to get to keep us in fear like oh you got you got to get your protein you got to get your uh what you know just any number of things that the, it, within the nutrition uh world they've tried to basically say okay you need this you need that you need that and any every time they're doing that it's they're trying to sell you something they're saying okay well here you make sure you, you get your get your serving of of protein get your meat and then they act like all protein is, is created equal or all calcium or whatever. It's just, but we reject all of that. I mean, we just don't even deal with Western nutritional dietetic theories in that way. You know, we start with the mucus diet healing system and, or at least a lot, a lot of us in the community, we're uh, not everybody, but a lot of us start with mucus diet healing system and say, okay, now let's take this filter from the mucus diet and let's 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 go and re-examine these theories you know because the protein theory i invite you guys to check out the history of that it's crazy that how they developed that they, they used to do a lot of sadistic experiments on dogs i mean the the protein theory the b12 theory all that was they would torture these dogs to death and the data that they that they picked up from from torturing these dogs uh ultimately developed into these theories of protein and uh b12 and all this other stuff and so we take a look at that and we say there's this whole thing is way more simplistic than all of that and so we we break it down to its lowest common denominator you can't be talking about health and all, and all this kind of stuff and you're still talking about eating pus and mucus forming foods and and, and not only eating them but saying that you have to have them because that's what as they say basically they're saying okay you have to have these foods or you fall over uh and we have a lot of people that eat the way we eat or fast for long periods of time like brother era they're not they're fine <laughs> you know they're doing they're doing quite well not worrying about all of these different counting calories and grams of this and all that kind of stuff and so, uh, yeah, so it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty insane. And it's just so confusing. And I can see how it makes it hard for people to accept the simplicity of something like the mucus diet healing system, because, uh, it's, it's like, it's, just, it's unfortunate that we've been orient, oriented and programmed to immediately go there to, to that, that fear you think about that it's like okay well how what have i been conditioned to think and you've been conditioned to be scared okay if i, I better i got to get enough of protein i got to get enough of this where is that same fear of uh, i better not get too i better not eat too much pus and mucus forming foods and get uh, get obstructed you know I, I better make sure that um, my, my colon is clean because the seat of all chronic illness is, is that colon. If you have chronic illness, uh, first place to look is that colon is going to be filthy. And, uh, and so we have a way to clean it, but it's, again, it's a way people don't like, <laughs> people don't like to talk about animals. People don't like to talk <laughs> about, uh, transitional foods and stuff. And so, but that's the simplicity of it. And so yeah. that was one thing that I really liked about it. Well, well, we should talk about the bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because this is another thing people don't like. My wife will say, why do you have to talk about it? You know, and I'm like, because that's what we do. You know, we talk yeah. about it because, you know, like we look at a horse before we buy them. We like to see that everything's working. When we look at the mouth and the anus of the horse, we've, we've got to come to terms with talking about these things that are culturally weird to talk about, but they're actually important when it comes to health. So, Let's talk about constipation because, mm -hmm. you know, is going to the bathroom, you know, the number two once a day enough or is that a constipated person? Yeah, uh, B, <laughs> because a constipated person. Uh, Eric, 
uses the term constipation in two different ways. So there, yes, there's the bowel constipation, but Eric also identifies constipation and cellular constipation, a constipation of the entire organism on a cellular level is the foundation of human illness because this constipation is also obstruction. It, anything that obstructs the body's functions, that obstructs the body from getting the amount, uh, the amount of oxygen to its cells that it's supposed to, the, the get, to be able to use that oxygen, uh, that's obstruction. And that, and that obstruction is the foundation of disease. Uh, but in terms of bowel constipation, yeah, yeah. For most people, if you're just having one little little bowel movement a day or something, as Eric says, one good stool a day means nothing. Uh, because if you right. got 32 feet of, un, of 10 and 15, 20 pounds of uneliminated fecal matter in your stomach, and then people wonder why they don't feel good. You know, oh, my back is hurting and this and that. I've had more people that I've just said, okay, do just do some lemon juice and distilled water enemas for, for a couple of weeks. And at the end of that, they're, oh man, my, my back pain is gone. And man, I feel, so I lost, I lost 15 pounds and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, yeah, man, I told you, <laughs> you know, that that was, it's simple. We just get that stuff out of there and you're going to feel better. And, uh, but again, the, the stigma, uh, for whatever reason that is there, trying to really trying to prevent humans from, as we would say, getting themselves together, healing themselves. They don't want that because one where I get more outraged, there's, yeah, there's the everyday person. But then when you go to an emergency room or some kind of hospital and they don't have enema kits in every room or a colonic system in every room, and it's not standard procedure. Every time you go into the emergency room, you get you a, a quick enema you know, you get the saline drip, you need to get the enema or colonic or whatever. Uh, and so things like that, something that simple could, would transform uh, uh, emergency rooms, transform uh, these hospitals. Uh, but that's, but that's, it's like a step too far that it's not, they're not there. Uh, and, and it's very unfortunate, but to prevent yourself from ending up in that situation, yeah, you know, the, the more that you take care of yourself now, clean your colon out. Uh, and we talk a lot about enemas, and we, we just did a, a song with the, uh, uh, at the Air Day celebration of the Professor Spira Brother Air Fire Music Project. Uh, we did a song called, there's a song that George Duke did called Dookie Stick. <laughs> and and, uh, and it's spelled like his name is George Duke, you know, so Dookie Stick. But I, we did the, the enema Dookie Stick. And so I, did, <laughs> so I had an enema bag on stage and I was like, you know, the, the, the first, uh, the, uh, you know, the hardest thing to do is just get it out the box. Just get the enema bag out the box, you know, do what you need to do. Stop trying to resist it. And uh so, uh, yeah, so there, as Eric says, so many minor ailments and issues can be totally dealt with just with enemas and a minor transitional diet, not even getting, get, not getting into the fasting, not getting into being 100% mucus free, just improving the diet and cleaning out the colon. That takes a lot of people really far, just that. Right. And so the other thing about this, there's no ego in this. Like you, I'm just tired of the, I eat this diet and I eat that diet. I don't accept you because you eat this. There's just enough division already. The simplicity in this is really, you were just talking about cleaning the pipes. They're the analogies right. we make, I'm, look at the pipes. If we're not move, if we have things in our body from when we were kids, including medication in our stomachs, you know, and that's the average person. Well, what does it mean to give our body a break and get that out? Right. It's, I mean, it's crucial. If we want to be around for our loved ones and our kids, if we want to feel good, if we want to be able to save the human species and prevent us from degenerating any further, then right. it, it's crucial. You know, this is the number one thing to me, you know, the number one most important thing right now for humans to learn about and get together. And the beauty of it is you can start doing it right now, you know, wherever you're at, whatever your situation is. You know, I work with people of all kinds of different 
uh, monetary situations uh, and, you know, class structure, people living in different parts of the world that don't even have fresh fruits and vegetables, unfortunately. But with these mechanics and understanding of these transitional mechanics and not being so strict and so, uh, you know, about every little thing, uh, you can, you know, you can still put yourself in a position where you can be pushing forward, cleaning yourself out. And then as you get cleaner, your mentality starts to change and get also get cleaner. And you can start to make changes in your in your life or you you'll want to make changes to if you need to migrate and move, you know, that's a it's, it's a historical thing that a lot of people have done the pit from uh, uh, the, of if you're in a situation that's oppressive, then, then you do, I mean, the poorest people have been ones in history that have found a way to move and to migrate when they needed to. The great so-called great migration of, uh, of blacks in the early 1900s from the South to the North. Uh, but just hit throughout history, there's always been people. So, and I just make that point because a lot of people say, well, I don't, I don't have the money to move, or I'd like to do this or that. And say, and I'm saying, look, look to your ancestors because at some, you go back far enough at some point, somebody who didn't have any kind of resources or money, they got their family together. They said, we're going to some, we're going into a better situation. We're going to, we're, we're going to do this and they move somewhere. And so, but you have to have that consciousness, that desire and understand, uh, and also not be doing it out of fear, you know, be doing it out of a sense of purpose and survival. You know, it's, it's a different thing. It's, there's a difference between kind of flailing around. And I see a lot of people doing that, unfortunately, within these, uh, some of the, the kind of the raw food is the healing diet fasting wing. There's people that kind of flail around because it's, is there people that are in pain and they have, they have negative symptoms and they're, they're trying, you know, but there's that, that's, you want to be calm. You know, I don't like to see people getting into mucus's diet because they're fearful uh, that you want to come at these kind of changes call as, as calm as you can be and get into the diet. And, and if you, as you get rid of all this waste, you're going to get calmer, <laughs> you know, you might, it might get worse before it gets better, depending on what kind of stuff your body is harboring. But, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it, it's going to come out. And so, uh, so yeah, so I, I'd say no, I don't, in any of those kind of excuses say, well, I don't have the money. I don't have this and that. If you, if you take the time to learn, it's all the, a lot of this stuff is, you know, is on online <laughs> for, you know, even I, I, they, somebody had posted up, uh, some, some of our, some of our stuff and I never said, okay, you got to take it down. It's like, it's out there. And, uh, and so it's, but you have to spend the time to do the research, to, to just read through the books, read through the materials and then assess your situation and start to make those progressive changes. I'm one who's been through it all. Cause I mean, I did the raw diet. I did that for about two years, a hundred percent raw back when, you know, back in the heyday when David right. was out here in San Diego yeah. and I was uh, going to those parties and we were having the hug circles and, and there was something wrong in that movement where, I mean, it exploded and people went back and started eating meat because it, it was going horribly wrong for them. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, at least you were, it, it was a step in the right direction where we want to get the plant foods in us, but people will tend to give up, go back, eat the meat and end up getting more mucus and pus in them. When the teacher was there all along with Arnold Era in the 1920s, right. the teacher was there to give us this information, which is a gift. You've taken it and brought it to the new level now so we can integrate it in a new way. And the recipes are so much easier now because he had things in there before that really didn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there but, was, yeah. But, yeah. but anyway, I, I, I'm not sure. Basically, I mean, for me and the work we're doing here at Juice Guru and we're educating people about juicing, mm -hmm. it ties in with what Eric taught, what you're teaching about juicing and juice yeah. cleansing. And But how do we go deeper with our diet? Who, Because that's where people get stuck with the confusion of, 
do I follow Dr. Furman or Esselstyn or do- Dr. Gabriel Cousins or do I follow uh, who's the herbologist, you know, more Norse, Dr. Morris, uh, you know, and, and then even in your community on Facebook, I see the, mm-hmm. the conflict of, well, you've got, uh, you got to do it this way or that way or this way. And even within right. this, this diet that is laid out and is simple and transitional and no judgment, they're still confusing confusion. Yeah. So the question is, I, I know, and if you're still listening, good for you because you're interested in your health. You're interested in going deeper. We want to thank you for being here. Yes, we will get some questions going. Uh, We're going to go a little deeper with the interview here. And again, it it goes deeper on his website and his podcast, Professor Spear at mucusfreelife.com. There's an e-course that I'm currently enrolled in. Professor Spear is going to get certified as a juice therapist this summer. We're both overlapping with the work we do to go deeper so we can teach in a much better way. And Nothing's resonated more than this book. It always goes full circle. Juicing turned my life around. The mucus-free diet was the thing that made sense before all the egos got in the way, before all the misinformation and confusion. And, and I'm just tired of it. And if you're tired of it too, let's go deeper with something that's it's sound and makes sense. And what, is it, what has it done for your life, Professor Spear, aside from, you know, you've lost the weight. I know spiritually, physically, Eric talks about all those things. What other benefits have you and, and the other practitioners over in Ohio experienced on this? Just a total transformation of body, mind, and spirit, as it says on the, the cover of Rational <laughs> uh, Yeah, I, at that time, I was searching. I had, uh, I had read, I uh, was reading a lot of books, uh, and I had enrolled in the, uh, the Parahansa Yogananda. You know, I'd read the autobiography of a yogi, and I had enrolled in the Kriya Yoga and was getting those, those, that was way before email. <laughs> I was getting all the actual physical things in the mail and uh, the lessons every week. So I was, got into that and I had studied other stuff, the Sedona method, which I actually still, still practice. And I got a video on that, how I combined mucus diet and some of those emotion releasing techniques and things to deal with the emotional side of, of, of it. But, uh, it it just it came at the right time when I was ready for it, and once I got into it, it was like okay, th- I need to do this because I remember even at the time when I was trying to learn Kriya Yoga, my I was so stuffed up I couldn't I just had just my whole sinus cavity just twenty four hours a day was filled with mucus and I'm blowing my nose and so I can't practice do these breath exercises because my nose is so filled up. So as I started to transition and clear that up i was able to do some of those breath exercises and really like wow for the first time i'm breathing i'm smelling things the taste of stuff is getting better i can actually taste the food uh in a whole different way and uh, and so then those are and that's just like the first several months you get those those kinds of things you know your, your things start to clear up uh i and as i started to lose weight you know i never tried to lose weight you know his brother air says we don't generally talk much about weight even though it's a popular topic and gets people interested we don't like to focus on that because as you transition and go down the path you're there's going to be day you know the part of the transition there's little ups and downs you know i got a couple times where i was, was like real skinny uh when i in early on as my body was just sort of getting rid of everything it's like okay let's let's start over again and uh, I found a picture of me early on in the transition where I'm, I mean, I'm really skinny. If you, if I show that picture, you're like, wow, you know, and, uh, but then I built and I built over that. So it was almost like I was reborn. And then now I'm, I'm <laughs> now I'm growing into my, this is like my adult size, like now all these years later, where, it, uh, from, from back then. But, uh, uh, one of the big things for me was, with the diet, I was able to think so much more clearly. And a lot of these, these ideas and these things, it was hard for me to articulate things and to think. And I was still wrapped up in, it was part of the stimulation culture that pus and mucus eating uh, promotes is when you, you feel a certain way with the stimulation, you, you got to eliminate it. You want to get rid of it. And so you find yourself in in bars or clubs or these kinds of places doing things that is not, are not are not healthy it's not healthy to get into fights but 
that's fun to a certain segment of people with, with a certain kind of elimination. It's different for everybody. Everybody sort of has their thing of what, what they are into, whether it, you know, it's going to the club or doing, you know, doing whatever. Everybody you know, kind of has their, their, their thing in the pus and mus- mucus world of what they enjoy doing and st- that's stimulating. And I found that I never tried to change my attraction to these things. You know, cause I, used, I was a big club person when I was a teenager. Uh, I really love going to the dance club and you eat drink and smoke and you know, all that kind of stuff. And I never tried to stop doing that. I never said, okay, I'm getting healthy and I'm going to stop. It was as I was doing my enemas and changing my diet, my body and my desire to do those things just left. And I, at that point, really, all I wanted to do was what I should have been doing anyway, which was practicing, going to places, making music, really devoting my efforts and my focus into music making and into studying. And so it was so much easier to do that, to be able to kind of have that laser focus once I took that stimulation out of there. And so, uh, so I then uh, going on into, I credit the diet for going on into graduate school because I had originally hadn't planned on doing that. My original plan was I'd get my degree in bachelor's in music, jazz, trombone performance, and then relocate to New York and just sort of do the path that so many other students of music have been doing over the past 20, 30 years, which is you're going to get your degree, relocate to Chicago, New York, Nashville, LA, or someplace like that. And you try to make it as a local you know, musician or you jump on a tour, you know, or something like that. And, uh, and so I kind of originally thought of that, but then once I got the diet, I was like, no, nah, this, this is more important. I, you know, I saw the same thing that brother air saw, cause he was in a similar situation in the eighties where he was, he would have been a famous jazz drummer in the eighties in that crop of back then they called it the young lions, but he was a part of all of that. And he consciously left it behind because he wanted to focus on practicing the mucus's diet. And he would say, I'll do that later. This is more important right now than becoming famous and some adored music star. And, uh, and so I felt the same as far as just, I'm a focus on this. And then my, it started to influence my art and my music making. And we put a band around, we, well, a band sort of popped up the birthday and ensemble that uh, many of the members practice a diet and it was all vegetarian band. And, and it was just one of those things that kind of manifested. And so that was in that group, that was where I kind of really started to talk publicly about the mucus diet. And we would do these art pieces uh, about the diet and of course now this music is something uh you know we'd, we'd had <laughs> it, it, it's it's something you would have to get into and study sometimes to get it. the average person might not understand what's going on because it's like avant-garde jazz free jazz some of the stuff you, you know has you would like you would relate to but some of the stuff has kind of got that kind of progressive kind of avant-garde art thing happening but he got into that and uh, and then just studying me uh, when I, I had did some juice fast, some pretty long juice fast in this first you know, five, four or five years of me practicing the diet. And I was, it was instead of eating, I would just, stu- I would just read, study. I would read practice. I, I used to go to the library and check out uh, like 10 documentaries at a time watch them in one day, like throughout the day, I'd be watching them. I'd be practicing. Then I'd take breaks to read. And, and then I would go back, return those 10 and get 10 more. And I would, I'd had the, I had the college library, the public library. And so I would go back and forth between both of them and just get in all kinds of different subjects. So I would study science documentaries and, uh, documentaries about language and philosophy and going through the classics of the, you know, the old Plato's Republic and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I just really, I just enjoyed that period just so much. I just, just really enjoyed that period 
Uh, I, <laughs> I said before, I, I would love to be able to get back to another study period like that. But right now I'm being called to share and, and, you know, and so it's, I don't, I can't just sit around for 18 hours a day studying like that. But, um, so, but that was, that was huge for me. Uh, and then that inspired me to say, well, okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of into this. Then let me go to graduate school. And so I went and got, got my master's and, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in jazz studies, and at that time, I was hired to teach survey of African-American music and musical world cultures at Northern Kentucky University. I was the youngest professor on campus, and I taught there for two years. They were going to give me a full-time, they were offering me a full-time lecturer position, and I turned it down to say, well, I appreciate it, but let me go get a PhD if I'm going to participate in academia at all. And I wasn't ready to settle down and kind of go in that direction. And even I was good at it at what I did with, with those classes I said, nah, let me go and, you know, let me keep studying. And so uh, that's why I got into the PhD program at Ohio state, uh, the, uh, the musicology program specialization in ethnomusicology and came up here to Columbus, Ohio and haven't, you know, haven't turned back, you know, got my, <laughs> uh, finished my PhD in 2016. And, uh, I taught introduction to jazz, a year and a half or two years ago at uh, Ohio State and and uh, you know once once I graduated I was like okay I'm I'm gonna take a break from academia for a while as I had been so entrenched in academia for a while I'm like okay I, it's time for me to, to play and all that kind of stuff but I did go back to uh, to teach that that class which was which was fun you know because that that's a whole other side of me where yeah I love talking about diet but I probably love talking about music even more. You know, we start getting into jazz and you know the history of, of black music and that kind of thing. You know, I really, really get into that. But, uh, but yeah, so those were some of the, how the diet influenced my trajectory and the decisions that I started to make and, and kind of, you know, took me in a different direction than I originally conceived of. And it's amazing. So, I mean, here's the thing about it. You know, everyone's wondering now, they're saying, what, okay, you said meat and dairy. Like, what, people are going to be surprised to hear what is mucus forming, what's mucus lean or, you know, okay to transition with. And so maybe we can talk about some of that. And I know there are some people in my audience that are raw foodists and are probably wondering, is this like a raw food diet or do I go backwards from where I am now? Or what exactly am I doing wrong as a raw food? As some people might be saying we have yeah. the gamut here. I can't just say, Oh, there's Brian. And I know him and his wife are raw and they're certified juice therapists. I see you, Brian out here. I know you and your wife are raw food and you guys drink juice. I see Rob is here and I know Rob is probably following more of a paleo type of diet. Rob, if I'm right, let me know in the chat box, Rob over in New Jersey. But, you know, it, it runs the gamut. And so I love that there's a progression to this. There's no rush on this. And as soon as you start making small changes, you could start shifting your body. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. And, I'll, and I see one of the comments from Denise, we were talking about eating wheat and some grains um, that the mucus starts to build up. One example of a small change a small principle, but an important one that Eric recommends for early transitional period, if you're at that level, is instead of just eating any old kind of wheat product, it's not forbidden to use wheat. I used wheat in the early days of my transition, uh, but how do you use it? And so there's a mechanical way to use it. If you toast it really well, if you have some kind of 100% grain, you know, wheat, there could be other, some other kind of grain bread that, uh, uh, that is, you know, doesn't have a whole bunch of that garbage added to it and stuff. Uh, you know, some of us had used like the Ezekiel brand bread kind of stuff or whatever. Yeah, like the sprouted stuff. Yeah. The sprouted grains and all that kind of thing. But basically if you, you toast it really well, which you, you know, do in a toaster, or you could do it in an oven, uh, toast it really well, then you don't just eat it discriminately. You would have it after you've eaten much of your vegetable meal, which would always consist of a raw salad, but there might be some, uh, if you're not on a raw mucusless level, uh, you know, you'd be eat cooked mucus free vegetables. 
Uh, but there's a way that you combine, and that's the kind of stuff I get into detail in the e-course with how you really line up these principles and combine these foods properly. Because uh, at the end of the day, what trumps everything is elimination. And when we say elimination, we just mean does does what is what you're eating going through causing good bowel movements, not creating indigestion. Because I can tell. Now, when you when you say causing good bowel movements, so we, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's almost like a taboo subject. People don't like to talk about anything. So you, you're talking about the way it looks, smells, and everything, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we. <laughs> yeah, we I just want to make it. I just want to make it clear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I and I, I forget sometimes that yeah, because we we talk about it so much. It's just the everyday part of our existence. And <laughs> there's, there's nothing uh, weird about it at all. But yeah, we you. you I mean, it would make sense. I mean, even animal, even your, even your cat or your animal inspects its, you know, it just it's going to check it out and see to make sure it smells all right and it's not something crazy and it looks okay. I mean, the animals are doing it, uh, and it's and it's a smart. There's a reason that they're doing it. You know, we're so our situation. We're so, I don't know. We're we're because we're again we're getting further and further away from who we are, from our nature, from you know our nature. This this whole situation is just taking us from that. And part of the reason that we, cause our, our the, the further you go down this road and you really clean yourself up, your bowel movements don't smell anymore. Not like that. Not like they used to. And so. And, is, and your breath is good when you wake up in the morning too. Isn't that right? Yeah. Breath is good. Uh, body odor, a lot of body odor is gone. And you know, when you, <laughs> start going down this road and you see these kind of changes you say, okay, well, this, this makes sense, you know, and you want to, you know, we, we're also looking for uh, uh, in the early days of folks uh, transition, if they're doing enemas or even just their bowel movements, as they start to ch- change their diet, they will uh, get what we call mucoid plaque. We talk a lot about that just because it freaks people out to see the pictures of it. I don't know. I don't know if you got any mucoid plaque pictures. Uh, yeah, there. go on and explain. I'll, I'll pull it up. Meanwhile, okay. but uh, yeah. So basically, the, the mucoid. <laughs> I plaque, don't carry them around like you do, but I'll pull it up. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. They. It's just that the unlimited uh, right. uh, slimy residue combines with some of the uh, uh, the natural mucus in your in your body and your colon. And you, there's all these, this whole, all these different species of mucoid plaque. Like, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to, yeah, we can. Well, yeah, there, see. there's like right here, you can see someone's pulling. It's actually, right. that's probably been in the intestine of that person since they were a kid. Oh yeah, definitely. Let me zoom in a little. I, I guess you guys can see that. Is that pretty yeah. clear? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's just an example, right, Professor? Yeah, just an example. There's so many. (laughs) uh, Yeah, years ago, the some of the pictures were only ones that I had posted up online uh, as I had took a scan from the the Bernard Bernard Jensen uh, uh, bowel management book, and that that was sort of the original (laughs) mucoid plaque images. And uh, then I took a couple pictures of my own that are that's out there floating around. And then now there's a lot more I'm noticing, at least on Google, uh, you can see a lot. Just type in mucoid plaque and, and, uh, and see all kinds of different variations and things and worms and stuff. Some of these things, they, these, these parasites and worms kind of die and they, if they're not eliminated, they just become part of you. <laughs> they're just still in there. And so some of that stuff, you look at it and like, man, you can see the little tapeworms and stuff in there and all that stuff comes out. You see it. Uh, you see it all come out as you go down. And you say better out than in, like we say the same thing, better out yeah. than in. That's going to cause in. disease. Yeah, yeah, better out than in. You, you know, uh, we don't, you know, at the end of the day, I, we like to ask, what do we really need? You know, do do we need, do we need then animal flesh? You know, do we need to consume that to, you know, and, and, and the answer is not only do we not need to consume it, but it, it causes so much illness is the foundation of so much of human illness and the dairy too though that's the thing because you know people can go vegetarian and be more unhealthy than a meat eater isn't that right 
Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the controversial things that Eric pointed out. Cause he has a couple controversial things that when you were bringing up the raw foods movement and kind of veganism and that kind of stuff, there's a number of things that he says that kind of makes folks in all of those communities mad. And that's one of the re- reasons why, uh, one of the reasons I think it, it hasn't gotten as popular yet as it, as it's going to be is because it was kind of at odds with some of the leaders and gurus of these other movements who were wanting people to buy their herbs or wanting them to buy their supplements and, uh, and and to have a more rigid kind of thing, because this it's, it's not rigid, but a lot of people, especially I noticed folks in the raw foods community, a number of them, they, they want something rigid. You know, it's like they embrace the rigidity of, uh, of some of these, not everybody. I'm not just not a blanket statement, but I'm just the people that I've worked with that I've, I've noticed that because what, what's, what I ended up doing is kind of setting ourselves up. Cause I saw how hard it was to communicate the mucus's diet to the vegan community, at least like six, seven years ago. They, a lot of folks there already thought that they were, doing great that they were at the top that even though they're getting you know oreo cookies and things like that they're saying we're not hurting the animals so they were happy i couldn't i couldn't talk to them unless they got sick then we could have a conversation but as a community i because you know dr morris and there's like dan mcdonald and kind of folks on that side of the raw foods community were really respectful of eric even uh David Wolf talks about Eric in, in a couple of his his books, but uh, really Dr. Morris and you know Dan McDonald are the two that I remember really talking kindly about Eric. And so, but what I noticed was people were trying to make lifestyle out of Dr. Morris's methodologies, and he would explain his methodologies are meant for people on their deathbed. Uh, <clears throat> but people, and to this day, I mean, a lot of people are trying to make lifestyle out of that. And, but what I would say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to participate and be here with, with, with this community that's growing, but I'm going to be kind of saying, Hey, check out the transition diet. You know, if you get to a point where you can't move forward and you hit the glass ceiling, you can't eat fruit anymore. You can't, you know, you're kind of, cause, cause they'll do these really long kind of fruit fasts and, and, and juice fast, all that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, well, that's cool. But if you get to a point where you need to transition, here's the, here's the stuff. And they were a lot more open-minded because they were getting to that point where they couldn't go any further. And because nobody else was really talking about a particular lifestyle to live, once you're done doing all of those more aggressive kind of, of uh, healing protocols, well, what do you do? There was a lot of people in that community. They were going back to eating their regular diets again. It's like, well, why would you do all that work, heal yourself, and then go back to your original diet? So we were able to kind of say what's way better than going back to your original diet is learn how to systematically and perpetually transition over the course of years. And so you want to find your plateau point, find a place where you're comfortable, you're satisfied, you're full, you know, I was, I've never been hungry on this and I've done long fasts and all this kind of stuff, but I put my meals together in such a way and always have by practicing the principles as recommended by Eric that I don't get, I don't get hungry. Like I used to, you know, when I, before the diet that, that I'd had all that hot stomach acid in there that was ready to chomp on some meat. And that stuff would start to irritate the lining and that we would call that hunger. Cause that's not real hunger as most of you all probably know. Uh, and, but on the mucus diet, all of that stuff, and especially all the way I did a lot of juicing <laughs> in the early days. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a whole lot of juicing. And, and I think that really helped to that along with the salads and just the transition diet to, to quell that acid so that type of hunger was a thing of the past. I mean, I never, after a while, I never had that anymore, that type of, uh, that type of hunger. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's an interesting thing that we're dealing with with these different communities. I had called some stuff years ago. I, there was uh, uh, a couple communities. I was like, that, though, that's not going to last. That, those are going to kind of fall apart. And I think I said, within four or five years, we're going to start to see a lot of people who 
just did not transition. They went full bore into the raw foodism and the fruit, and they're going to end up going back to like raw, raw meat, you know, and back then paleo was the thing. Now they're calling it keto. You know, before that it was like Atkins, they're all related, you know, that type of thing. And, and that's what's been happening. You know, there's been vegans kind of mm-hmm. falling off doing these, they always have to do those videos and they have to announce it. You know, it's like to make them <laughs> feel good about them. You're like, this is what I'm doing. And I'm yeah speaking up. It's like, you know, all right. I'm a, I don't know. I might've had kept that to myself, but okay. If you, if you feel like you need to share that, but, uh, but yeah, so, but I'm, I'm happy to see there people are be getting more open-minded to the transition to, dive into that uh, those ideas to that process and uh and i think the more that people do that the more we're going to see uh, successful long-term practitioners of these uh of the mucus diet than just the plant-based diets in general right professor spear and and the arnold eric called uh people that follow this practitioners i, I love that mm-hmm. and we should talk about addiction you know when it comes to food and It just seems that the more, um, you know, the things that are mucus forming seem to be the most addictive foods, you know, these are the foods, you know, that we grew up on, there's comfort eating in them, and it is the meat and the dairy, but it's the other things, the nuts and the seeds that could be uh, mucus and pus forming and or or mucus forming, and maybe we can talk about avocados a little too, and maybe about the foods that you would say are good transitional foods, and and I know some people are just like, what, do you just say avocado, but you know, do, do you say avocados are mucus forming too? Did, did Arnold Eric talk about that? Yeah. So yeah, avocados are mucus forming, but they can be used for transitional purposes. So that's part of the education is to understand there, this is not a cut, a, co- a cold kind of thing where it's like, if it's mucus forming, it's a forbidden. The question is how can it be used if you're using an avocado in the place of say oil or something and you're, or you're creating some kind of salad dressing or something like that, the transitional basis, as long as you understand uh, what it is, then that's good. Now, when you get into these folks that are eating six and seven avocados at a time, now you're way off the reservation. That's a problem. And so again, it's, it's not just that the, that an item is forbidden or evil. It's how are you using that item? If you're using it, in a way that is transitional, that's not, uh, you know, the, the sixth avocado kind of in a, in a meal kind of thing. Well, it's the idea of eating it with the broom, right? Like yeah, the intestinal yeah, broom. The broom, if you're having a big right. salad with that avocado, you exactly. it, it's through better. Yeah, yeah, with the big salad, it's, it's going to move through just like, you know, any oil. See, Eric wasn't a stickler about condiments. So the, the oils, you don't want to overdo it, but you don't have to be – super strict on that level especially early on Uh, and when you want to be stricter experiment with it so experiment going days or a week or or however long without oils or totally mucus free with with no fats at all you know and so one of the more controversial things Eric probably said was that all fats are mucus forming and unusable by the body and unnecessary Uh, and so and that's where there, I clarify a couple discrepancies in the mucus diet. There's a couple discrepancies in there. And I talk about those in the annotated version uh, because there are other people have touched the mucus diet book. You know, there's, there's a, I don't, won't get into the whole story of how the book came together, but uh, Fred Hirsch, who continued to publish the book for many, many years, he made changes to it over the years. And uh, and we can kind of go back to different versions of the book and see uh, when the changes were made and that kind of stuff. But uh, there's a confusing part where Eric says that all nuts or or all fat forming items, even vegetable based ones are mucus forming. Yet there's another part of the book that says that nuts are mucus free. And so, so those are the kinds of things that have confused people, you know, for years with the diet. So I try to, uh, clarify all of those things because at the end of the day, it's not, it's really not that big a deal. You know, people, people make big deals out of stuff. That's just not that big a deal. It's just because we should be experimenting with, you know, how, how do you feel as part of mastering this system to me is to experiment with 
and experience the different levels of the transition. You want to master these different levels. What is it to be on the, the nuts and raisins level? That's one of the things you always want to eat nuts with raisins as recommended by Eric, because it helps it eliminate uh, if you're at that thing. Now, if you're into the raw food where you're, uh, 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 you're doing the soaking the nuts, you know, that's, that's a, another thing, you know, I'd still combine it with the raisins if you're going to eat it and not blend it up or do something with it. But, uh, so, but you, you experiment with that. You can experiment being 100% mucus free, you know, be mucus free for a day or two, then, then step it back, find some cooked mucus free uh, vegetables and some of those menus that, that you like, or, uh, you know, just experiment and really, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of people do that yet where they develop a, a mastery and an understanding of all of these different plateaus. I like to, I call them plateau points, uh, where you find something that's comfortable that you can kind of groove it out for a period of time for, and, and that prevents all this, the yo-yo stuff, the yo-yo dieting. And cause some people will try to, and, and, and it's generally people that are trying to impose other things onto the mucus's diet. Like, like raw food principles and this other stuff that creates or, or people that have, you know, come into the mucus diet book from say inspired by someone like Dr. Sabi or something like that. I've noticed that it's, it's hard for them to do what they need to do because they're trying to com- combine these other philosophies and methods with the mucus diet when they're not really combinable, they don't really go together well. And so I encourage people spend some time with the mucus diet and really try to focus on that for a while to see what it is, to see if it is what it is and, uh, and avoid that. Uh, you know, I, I call the mucus diet, the, the middle path, you know, the plant-based middle path, because it really is no matter where you are, if you're more advanced, there's a, there's a higher level that you can transition to. You know, if you're coming from fast food and you're constipated, then you know, we, we have all there, all the tools are in there to get you feeling better really quick. And, uh, and so that's where I think this is different. Cause I, I often say that if I would have been introduced to the mucus or if I'd have been introduced to say raw foodism and not the mucus diet, I wouldn't have got into it the way that they talk about it, the way that it's framed, the, even the people that I follow and, and look at later on the way that that's framed for me, it, it just it wouldn't have resonated. I already know from where I was coming from and that kind of strict, there was no mechanics. Most people don't, they don't talk about things mechanically or systematically. It's just, you know, raw as law and all cooked food is the, is the bane of humanity right. and, the, and, and just that kind of thing. And I just, that had turned me off right away. And so that's, that's where I think the mucus is diet. Once this message can get out to that can start to get out into the mainstream, I think it, it can be embraced probably more so than some of these other things that have been getting popular. Uh, but it's people have to get past that initial, you know, they're, where they're expecting something really rigid. You know, well, that's the thing. And, and, and I, th- I love that you're really highlighting the transition part, because when I read the book, I don't think I really grasped that part or I thought maybe he meant like a weak transition. I wasn't sure what he meant. Like I see Denise mm-hmm. is saying, Oh my God, I eat avocados on a regular basis. I had no idea. And so you see that people start worrying, Oh no, I, if I want to do this, then I have to give up some of the things I love. And it's totally not like that. Right. I love the, the non dogma approach but for this. That you yeah. can just take it step by step, right? Yeah, yeah. You can take it step by step. Like I tell a lot of people when you read the book, and I think I'm I'm gonna share a link in the chat for those that's in the chat. This is a link to which is not on my <laughs> should be on my regular page, but it's not. That's a link to all all seven of the books. I have them all bundled up in one bundle if you're interested in in that. But uh yeah, I've I've, that's what I wanted was, yeah, the non dogmatic approach, even though people try to impose and say that there's these, that we still have these dogmas and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you're, you're, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna make everybody happy. (laughs) There's always gonna be the trolls out there, but that was important for me. And why I like to approach things in, you know, you know, I spent time in academia and that more academic approach would say that it's just objective. So we, we can look at the ideas objective 
but we can also look at the methods objectively. And so you don't have to believe in Eretz philosophies or some of his more controversial theories to practice the transition diet, you know, to practice those mechanics. And so I, I always encourage people when they read the book to say, look, there's going to be some stuff that you're going to read that you're, that might blow your mind or just be like, wow, what is he saying? Just keep going. And once you get to those mechanics that no matter what you believe in, you can, you can use those, you know, you can use those transit because they're natural babies use them. You transition a bit when a baby first thing it does, it's breathing. (laughs) It comes, it comes out the womb and, and it starts to breathe oxygen. And do you, do you put the baby on solid food right away? No, they're, they're, nature bi- builds in a liquid diet transitional process for every human to, and when they're a baby. And so you transition, you on a liquid diet for a while. Then the parent instinctively will start to, you know, back in the, back in the day, I don't know if this is something, you know, but just you know, back in the day, they might've, you know, the pre-chewed food, I guess now they do the purees and all that kind of stuff. But you know, there's uh, uh, th- th- there's a mechanics that's natural that a lot of mothers do without even, you know, if they're not too into the Similac and all that, that kind of scary stuff uh, that, that that's there, that that's still intact as far away as we're getting. I mean, the, the Similac kind of represents us just going way off into outer space. But, uh, but that transitional process is, is important as I often tell, cause some people say it's the mind. They're sort of the, the mentalists that say, Oh, you're, you, you can just skip over the transition. It's just all mental and say, well, if that's the case, then why can't a baby just use their mind to transition to, to will in to existence their, the aging process so that they could just skip over Mm. one, two, three, four, five, they can skip over that and just become an adult using only their mind. That's it's, it's an absurdist type of mentality to, to try to throw away a tr- the transition uh, be, uh, using that type of argument. It's like, Oh, it's just mental. It's like, no, what we're talking about is natural trans the, and all you, and you have to look no further than a baby transitioning from a liquid diet into to to mushy foods you know the kind of pre-diet pre-chewed or pre uh uh, kind of purees and that kind of thing into solid foods and then the unfortunate thing about a lot of children today is they are then transitioned not into fruits and green leafy vegetables but transitioned into the pus and mucus processed foods of civilization and they are, and even then, that's something to understand. You're, you're transitioned into that to be able to consume those foods and, and handle them. You had to transition into them. You couldn't just go in and out of the blue, eat a Whopper or a Big Mac or a fish sandwich or something. You transitioned into that. And so for me, I look at transition not as a choice, but as a natural law that is observable all over the place from the seasons that change all the time from baby transitioning into adulthood uh, from an artist learning how to paint or learning how a musician learning how to play. You can't skip over the gradual process of, of learning these things. It's, it's a gradual process. It's a transitional process. And so I find the transition to be, it's, that's why we say it's a lifestyle. It's a transitional lifestyle. There's all, because there's always a higher level that you can get to. You know, people want there to be some identifiable ultimate level. Like, okay, once you're, okay, where, where do I need to go? If I'm mucus free. And, and that's another thing that probably turns people off because there there's, I, I don't like to, to put people in that type of box to say, okay, this is the ultimate goal. You know, it's wherever you take it because we have people that practice a diet just to heal themselves of some, of some really painful illnesses and they find where they like to be. They, they've read everything and they studied everything and they find a plateau that works for them and they live their life. 
Uh, there's other people like Brother Air that are trying to push, pay, you know, trying to just break down barriers and push the the, the limitations of what you thought. Was right. what, what has he done so far? He what did he do? Like a, a six month. So 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 twenty years into practicing the mucus's diet, he did he did his first year on fruit. So he tr- did classic transition for for twenty years. And then, and he did a lot of juicing and uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. As he, and as he told you, you know, he knew, personally knew the juice man and, and all that right. kind of stuff. And then, so after 20 years, he did a year on fruit where he, he ate nothing but fruit for a year. And then, and, and, and after that, he started doing these long fasts. So he was doing a uh, hundred day juice fast. Then after I met him, I think a year after I started practicing diet, he started doing a, a really long juice fast that lasted for it was eight and a half months. So that was his first eight and a half month juice fast. Then he ate, he broke the fast and he only, he ate for maybe two months and then he did another juice fast. And that second juice fast was nine and a half months. And since then, He's probably only eaten maybe nine months, nine months out of the past ten years or something. I mean, he's he's just hasn't eaten that solid food that much. And as he fasts more and more, he's doing more and more dry fasting, which I don't I don't promote. I don't tell people to go dry fast. Eric didn't promote dry fasting, but this is an example of somebody that's at the highest level of practicing these systems that we're talking about and we're seeing the results we're seeing where these things can be taken now now the practice is being taken beyond where eric was at you know right because eric was 54 when he died in a tragic yeah well, yeah 56 yeah 56 right and so eric so so brother air might be one of the longest practitioners Maybe is that possible? He might be one of the long doing this the longest out of anyone. I mean, he's one of them. I've, I've, one of the things doing what I do, I've met a number of people that are just not public figures that don't want to be interviewed or all that kind of stuff that have been practicing on various levels for even longer than Brother Air. And but I mean, at the level he's at, at where he's barely he's even at, eating. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's in a class of his own when it comes to that. And uh, so b- because there's a number of people that are coming out, you know, and they say that they uh, uh, that they don't eat anything or they might have gone, you know, they'll go a year or something of doing some kind of fast or something. And they'll say, OK, I'm that, you know, I won't bring up those. There's like these terminologies they'll use. I say, well, I'm this. I don't eat anymore. You know, that kind of stuff. But oftentimes they, they that's 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 bogus you know because they it's after a while they ultimately do you know they didn't transition long enough they're still susceptible to anything but he's just continued this transition and the idea is if if you can fast a day then what why not two days or three days you know and you transition yourself you get yourself uh, physically to a point where you don't need the is the way we look at food is in a transit uh, in a elimination capacity. So when you're drinking your juice, when you are eating your salads, when you're eating your fruit, it is cleansing your body. So we focus on the cleansing and the elimination properties right. of all these foods, as opposed to trying to analyze what's being absorbed and the nutrient theory and that kind of stuff. And so when you're, look at it through that lens, then you start to understand why he's able to do what he's doing. Uh, and again, you know, I don't, I don't promote and tell other people that that's what they should be doing after years of practice or nothing like that. He's a pioneer. He's going, I mean, out- it could sound really extreme to most people. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. know that I would ever want to just not eat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it does. And that's why, and I don't even talk about my own, as I've done when I, or much, I mean, I talk about it in spirit speaks. I kind of, uh, the, my, my book, uh, I get into a lot of these kind of details of things that I ate early on in my transition, the real mucus forming stuff, 
uh, when I was still, you know, kind of going to Taco Bell early on and getting, the, you know, the plant. Right. Or stuff. that, that veggie burger that you like to trade. Yeah. Or the, yeah. The major <laughs> burger. Exactly. The, and, um, and so I talk about that, but I also talk about my fast. I did a six month long fast. It was two or I just forgive his two or three years into practicing a diet. Uh, I think it was three years into practicing a diet. I did a six month fast. And then I fought, then I, then for several years after that, I did a, a more fast. I did a, I did another six month juice fast, then another, then I think a five month and then a four month. And then I stopped doing those long fasts. And right now I'm not doing long fasts right now at all. Well, and Eric said they weren't necessary. Yeah. Yeah. They're not necessary. I've never promoted them. I've never said, Hey, look at me. I did this long fast. I've never, <laughs> I just don't find that interesting or, or do that at all. I'd say, you know, check, when you check out that, and that's why I focus. I, sometimes I get flack from some people saying, Oh, you, you know, you focus too much on the book or you this, or, you know, we, we should be pushing the stuff ahead or all that kind of stuff. I'm saying, look, First of all, if you if you take a class on Shakespeare, you're you're going to focus on the works of Shakespeare. You might maybe you'll talk about some something modern and its relationship to that work, but overall you're going to focus on the work of Shakespeare. And so and, and, and it keeps you from getting confused. It gives everybody a a common ground a, uh, to to start from which is sorely needed when I look into the raw foods movement and the veganism, there, there's no kind of common ground and everybody is kind of flailing and into their different factions and, and, belief, and belief systems and stuff. And so with mucus is I'm saying, let's take an, a more academic approach to studying this stuff and looking at it objectively and analyzing it. There's, and I'm the first one to say, you know, I don't agree with everything in the mucus diet book there. And I talk about that from time to time, different things there. Uh, it's usually more some of the philosophical things that me and Eric just have different differences of opinion, but that can rationally be discussed. That's a more elevated discussion when you get to a point where you can have the conversation. My, my thing, it's been hard to get people to that level <laughs> to, of, of knowledge of the information, to even have those discussions. But uh, but yeah, so that's why I, I work as hard as I do to try to say, look, this is the plant-based middle path. When people like Steve Jobs uh, interpret the mucus's diet in an in a extremist way, that's not Eric's fault that in so many people ignore the transition diet lessons. And so that because there's a number of people that give a bit of lip service to Eric, and just say, yeah, Eric, you know, talked about fasting or he talked about uh, mucus, then there's a lot of people that say, okay, yeah, I like Eric, but they've never really studied or read the book. Or if they did, it was as if they just ignored the transition diet lessons as if they're better than that. Like, oh, I'm, right. way, I'm <laughs> way more advanced than this. I, and so yeah, I've just tried to be a voice of reason saying, okay, I mean, do, do what you want to do. But if you ever find yourself in a predicament where you're like, man, this isn't working and, and I'm you're going through some kind of eliminations or whatever, we're here. <laughs> you know, the transition methodologies is here and it, and it can work. But don't get to a point of no return. That's where it gets dangerous. And I've seen that happen to some of the folks that are trying to do these long fruit fast and this kind of stuff. Uh, they, because there is no, because uh, one of the benefits of Eretz when, when we're talking about fasting and the way that Eretz lays out fasting is you want to put your body on this sort of elimination cycle. And so you, when you're just on the fruit, on fruit juice or eating nothing but fruit or something like that, that's more aggressive and your body is kind of starts to kind of contract. It's squeezing out this waste and when you break that up with some kind of, there's a number of different things to break a fast with and break things up. But when, when you break it up with say some kind of uh, strategically placed salad or something like that, then it, it lets the contraction go and, and, and you get this uh, tension and release process, which is, what it's all about in terms of that, that level of transitioning and healing and eliminating waste. 
And, and a lot of people are trying to, they're not doing that because they're trying to do two month long fruit, heavy herbs, that kind of stuff. And in some circumstances there, there's that, that would be recommended in cer- some circumstances, but not everybody. And so that's a problem that I have when I look out into that community, there's not enough people that just saying, let me work up to that. Let me transition. Let me get the tension and release that my, that's natural to my body. And, uh, and, and which makes the cleansing process a lot easier ultimately. Well, before we take a couple of questions, if you have any questions, type them in the box or we'll take a few on video, just raise your hand and we'll get you in the queue and you can come on live with us. We have a few more minutes. Um, I did want to touch on death culture. I know you talk a lot about the death culture and if you could explain to our audience a little more about that philosophy. Yeah. So the death culture, well, first you look at the word death, what's in, what's in it. E A T eat. (laughs) So right there, we're already seeing some connections, but so when we use the term death culture, everything in our reality out here is, is revolves around death. So look at the, the, the main forms of entertainment, movies that are revolving around death. They have a whole section called horror films. Uh, when you go into, uh, I guess people don't go in anymore. They <laughs> do everything online. But back when we used to have a video store, you go in, there's a whole section called horror movies. There's death in each one of those, gore and depictions of death. They've tried to make an art out of how, how to depict death in different ways, depict the macabre, all these things. Why isn't there a section called immortality videos or, you know, the immortality mythologies or something like that, the, the immortal characters? There's, there's only a few that we can find. There's the Peter, Peter Pan is basically an immortal character. Every, you know, here and there you can find these stories, but they're, they're not as prevalent as the death based stories that's just the entertainment look at the video video games i mean they're they revolve around i mean it was a big deal when i was coming up the uh the mortal combat it was just a little bit of blood and you were you know you they have a fatality now the stuff that they got out now is just like it's a whole different level of death uh the uh uh the you know, the religions that people are into you know and i usually avoid getting too deep into those discussions publicly because I'm that's that's a whole other pro as a whole other issue but there are several that I can think of that use death as, as sort of as a, as a symbol to symbolize different things and so everywhere we look there's death you look up at the billboard there's somebody eating a dead animal you look on tv somebody's getting killed uh, you on your video game, someone, you know, you're killing somebody or somebody's killing you. You turn on the news. Somebody was murdered today, probably in your city. Uh, somebody was killed in an auto accident. So everything in our life is revolving around death and nobody is, and, and, and there's nobody saying that that's not okay. There's nobody offering an alternative except us saying we need to, to stop embracing and, being a part of this death culture and build a life culture, a culture that's about life. That's about that focuses on life. And so, uh, so that's what we try to do. And we're in the process of doing is uh, developing a a whole different society and a whole different nation of people, culture, whatever term you want to use for a, a group of people that are, going to move away from the standard reality and to say that it, it can be done and it is being done, but the, we have to have the courage to break away from the death culture, from the death society and say, I'm not going to be a part of that anymore. I'm not going to focus on that. You know, I, this (laughs) reminded me, I went to a health conference this years ago and I got a documentary on my YouTube from way years ago that, that this happened, but we went to a, a health, it was supposed to be a health convention for African Americans. And there was a, uh, uh, spring Grove cemetery was at a health conference selling plots 
I mean, the audacity. You're going to go to a health conference <laughs> and set up a display and get people to, to buy their, their graves f- from you. I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking about. This, this thing out here is, is sick, and we have, to, we have to identify it as such and make the changes ourselves. You know, we had to make those changes because we can't force anybody else to change. But the one thing that we can control is what we're putting in our body. And so we have to start there. And then, you know, that, that's going to manifest itself into something beautiful. The more of us that start to really get on the same wavelength there. And it's in the language that cake is to die for, you know, that, how about the food is to live for? Go. So I just see, um, yeah. Thank you, Professor Spear. We're going to be wrapping it up now. So if you have any questions, type them in the box. I see we've got a couple in there. And if you want to come on video, then just go ahead and tell me in the box and I'll, I'll bring you on as a panelist and you can actually interact here with us. Um, Brian said, what sort of things can I consume while on a solid food vacation to really get out the mucoid plaque like we showed earlier in the picture? So one of the things is there uh, in the Mucus Diet book, there's something called the standard combination salad. So combination salads combine uh, some of the firmer vegetables. So you have the chopped up uh, uh, things like uh, chopped up cabbage and carrots and celery and that kind of stuff. And when you make that in into a salad, then you eat that it's acts as a broom on your intestines that that kind of rough uh, vegetable goes down and just sort of brooms stuff off of your intestines. Now, if you systematically add in some lemon juice and distilled water enemas, which is what we recommend and we promote that, uh, that people to investigate that and check it out. I have, and in my book spirit speaks, I have detailed instructions on how to do uh, lemon juice and distilled water enemas. If you systematically combine broom salads along with uh, the, uh, along with the fruit eating, because there's a, a well, I think uh, he's on a juice cleanse because he's okay. saying a solid food vacation. Okay, well, if you're on just the juice cleanse, then I would say get into the lemon juice and distilled water enemas, and and see because that takes your fast to a whole different level. Because if you're fast, if you're just juice, just juicing and in, in, in that realm. Once you start to add in a little little bit of that, that colon irrigation and you clean out, that's when you can start to see some of that black tar stuff might come out, the mucoid plaque, uh, the, uh, depending on what kind of juices you're drinking, if it's, if it's killing uh, parasites and stuff in there, you do the enemas, that's, it's going to come out much more efficiently. And so, uh, so, yeah, so that would be, if you're not eating anything, I would say, yeah, lemon juice and distilled water animals yeah. would be my right. He said the lemona. And then the Denise lemon. asked Denise asked why distilled water for enemas. We just find it to be is the cleanest water that we that we know it's clean. You know, there's no question, there's no uh, you know, because I would love to be able to just go get spring water, but where I live, they're, they're filthy. The springs are filthy, so I can't just go and get some good spring water. Maybe if I was living in Switzerland or something, I'd go get some of that. But overall, we we know that it is clean. You know, I know there's a lot of people disagree with the, you know, there's kind of the water wars, like distilled versus the reverse osmosis versus blah, blah, blah. We just keep it simple. We've always just dealt with distilled water because it's, there's no question about it. And, and, the, and the things that people say negative about it, that, that's not been our experience. We've not experienced leaching of minerals or anything like that that people claim is a problem with using distilled water. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Denise. And Raina said, is it okay with, let me just see here. Oh, is it okay with just with diet? No need for extra cleanse, liver flushes, Castor oil, salt water flush, enemas. So I'm not a I'm not a fan of salt water flushes. I'm just much rather see somebody do consistent lemon juice distilled water enemas, or uh, and, I, and I tell people to if you go check out if you have the money get some colonics. But uh, I always say you know the enema is sort of that that consistent. You know you have that you can control it. It's inexpensive, uh, and you can get into that 
you know, I call some of these other things ancillary therapies and those have to be kind of examined on an individual basis and one-on-one. So there's some of them that I do recommend or use with clients if I think, cause I only recommend something if I think that it's going to help them. So if I'm working with somebody and I think they, they really need to benefit and could benefit from some herbs uh, and going in that direction, and then I, then we go in that direction. Uh, you know, I, I'd spent for a number of years, I studied, uh, a lot of my herbal approach is kind of in line with like, somebody like Dr. Morris or something like that. But I'm the only person I know that really combines mucus's diet with, uh, with, with those kind of herbal approaches. But, uh, but yeah, so, but as far as, yeah, I'm not a fan of saltwater flushes, not a fan of those kind of like the, the, the liver cleanses or the coffee enemas. Uh, a lot of those things kind of ta- can tax the body. I know there's people that have, gotten a lot of benefit from doing various things and you know Eric would call a lot of those so like the Gershon therapies and things they'd call that like a camouflage fast because uh you are even even though there's things in there that we might not recommend it's still a fast you know even when you're uh, people on their deathbed or are, are, are trying to recover in a coma at a hospital even though they're pumping them with this liquid that we would find abhorrent they're still the the fact of the matter is they are still on a liquid diet and when they do heal and come out of that they're they're actually fasting even in a hospital and so fasting is the law still whether you're in a hospital or you're in your in in your the comfort in your home uh, the fasting is, is going to be a way to deal with a lot of issues and a lot of healing issues Let's see here in the Q&A box. We've got Juliet. Can't wait to learn more and check out the professor's website. Thanks for the group meeting. Thank you for being here. Um, And I have Tina. I feel like the more I heal, the less I want to eat. I'm I'm blending my food a lot. It makes me feel better. Some days my body just calls for water and I ignore it uh, and give it to the convention that I have to eat and give in to the conviction or, or... uh, when I listen to my body and give it what it wants, feeling better is my reward. Such a mental ego perspective to eating, she was saying. So I think the question is how to heal without having a healing crisis, trying to reduce fibroids without becoming anemic. And again, if we're going to get into like personal thing, I should say the question should be a little broad. We don't really want to do any one-on-one consulting or because it's so specific to our audience and it would really require a much deeper dive and we don't want to give misinformation and we're not doctors and right. But right. Exactly. So well, how would you answer that question though? Uh, generally uh, professor Spira. So, uh, so well, the transition, I mean, what we've been talking about this whole time, learning how to systematically transition with mucus free foods, throwing in some mucus forming foods with the mucus free foods when you need to, uh, having short, short-term fasting periods. Uh, that's, that's the system. You know, the system combines all these things we've mentioned throughout this talk today, the, the, the diet, the menus, how you eat throughout the day, uh, leaving off breakfast and having something, a lunchtime meal and a supper meal and juices throughout the day, uh, enemas either in the morning or in the evening, uh, all of these things, you start to put them together systematically, and that's the power. It's not one thing. Uh, it's not just I'm just focused on herbs, or I'm just focused on the food, or just focused on raw foodism. It's there's all these different tools that are the right tools, and you start to put them all together, and uh, and you can have some some miraculous things happen. Uh, and and also if you then find yourself in a position where you need to fast longer and you need to dig deeper to heal a particular ailment, you will be in a position to better do that because you've experienced the short-term fast, because you've already explored a lot of these things with your body. And so that gets you prepared to be able to do some of these longer, more intensive uh, healing uh, periods that folks are getting into without the transition. <laughs> and I think we've got a couple more here. You, you've got time for a couple more and then we'll close it sure. out after that, yeah. Professor Spira. Sure. Uh, let's see, uh, Brian, uh, Professor Spira, how long of a juice fast did you do to really clean your colon? 
So I would say probably within the first six months of me practicing the mucus diet, I, the, just doing the system is really what was key for me to clean the colon. And I remember about two weeks after doing the enemas, I, I was doing some kind of a juice fast and I don't, I don't remember how long it was, but the key there was I was doing daily lemon juice and distilled water enemas. And I'll just never forget. I had an elimination. I call it the black tar elimination and I hadn't been eating anything black or, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing grape juice or anything. There was nothing. <laughs> it was doing apple juice or something like that. Uh, and I had this black tar elimination. It just smelled like death and was just ran, just totally rancid, totally nasty. And after that, I mean, I didn't have those anymore. You know, once you have one of them, <laughs> one of those eliminations early on, you usually don't have to have another one of those unless you fell way back. And so I, after that, I felt like my colon was, was on the road to being cleaner. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that, that was big, getting that, that black tar out of there. And, and Tina asked, does Professor have a healing center? No, but that is interesting that you say that because we we have plans on developing a we call we're calling it a arid village, and it, we're in the embryo stages of putting this together. But it's it's going to be different from anything that's out there now. We're going to have a sustainable uh, a, a sustainable living village. It's all totally sustainable, off the grid, all clean energy earth ships and all, all that kind of stuff. And at the air day celebration this last weekend, one of our speakers, uh, Dylan keg, she worked with the person that invented earth ships and she went through his Academy and is uh, uh, skilled in that area. And so she gave a presentation on the, our vision of an air village and earth ships. And it was a really great presentation. And I think I'm going to post that one up in its entirety on my YouTube channel, uh, Professor Spira, uh, Mucus Free Life LLC. And uh, so, yeah, so that's, so yes, no, we don't, we don't have a healing center yet. And the, you know, consultations are, you know, I had to take a break from doing a lot of consultations because my time, because just time and and things. And so uh, I write, I was, I did a few for people that gave to our GoFundMe campaign uh, uh, last month. But right now, I'm not at this moment. I'm not accepting uh, new clients. But uh, but that's where I would say you. I encourage you to check out the e course. I'll, I'll put a link up real quick for the people that are interested. Yeah, and if you're listening on the show, we'll put a link up under the show notes at juicegrowradio.com for the e course and the bundle. Yeah, and so if if you want if you want the paperbacks and the e course, then I what I suggest is get get the bundle, get the book bundle with the paperback books. And then as soon as you purchase that, you'll, you'll go, there's, there's a upsell to the, uh, to the e-course with a really great deal uh, where you can get the e-course for really cheap. If you get the book bundle and then the e-course, if you only want the e-course that because the e-course does have all of the electronic versions of the book in, in within it, uh, then there's the, the separate link for that. The e-course is great. I highly recommend it. I'm loving it. Um, So total props on that. Um, Professor Spira, again, we didn't go deep into the (laughs) Eric Day, uh, you know, celebration, but you guys got a sense that they're doing this. This was their second year doing it. And this is an annual event on on, uh, Eric, Professor Eric's birthday that you guys are doing out there in, in Ohio, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So around his birthday, you know, kind of, it's like one of those things like Mark, Martin Luther King day isn't on his actual birthday. It's it's celebrated on the closest weekend or whatever. So, but, uh, but yeah, we, the closest weekend to Eric's birthday, we decided to have an event that just gave honor to Arnold Eric. And last year we had it in my backyard on a shoestring budget. And uh, it just kind of, did what we could do to put it together and put a, a lot of work into it to get those events going. Then this year we kicked it up a notch, got a, a beautiful shelter at a, which really I lucked out to get, cause it's a shelter that is usually 
a year in advance, it's already booked up and somebody canceled a booking. So we're, we were able to get in there and, uh, and, and yeah, everything just really pulled together. Folks, you know, they flew in from other countries and drove in from out of town and, and, and we had people that really helped out tremendously with, with, with the cooking, the food or food preparation and the juicing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as well as uh, other elements, we had live music and uh, and just everybody was really really happy about it. They uh, a number of people said they wish they didn't have to leave. They didn't want to go home after the weekend. They just they would love to stay in that community. Wow. Uh, the the way that it felt and the vibe, everything was everything was right. And so uh, I'm just really happy that it turned out well. And we're, we're already looking to next year to, to get a, get an earlier start on everything. Now that we really know how to do it and what, what it takes to kind of put everything together, we're, uh, you know, we're looking forward to, to next year and to having a lot more people I think are going to come next year. Well, thanks again for being here. Anything to say in closing to our audience, just about, taking the leap, making the transition, you know, get the bundle to you figure out what foods you want to move towards and not give up the things you love, but just move towards gently. Yeah. I would just say, just keep an open mind and get into the study, you know, read the books. Uh, like I said, we got the links to where you can access all, all the books that we have. There's other versions of the mucus diet, but whatever you do, just get into the information, keep an open mind. Don't think that you have to agree with all of Eric's theories. Just when you go through the, the philosophical aspects, just read it like you would any other philosopher, just like, just sort of ponder it and just consider it. Okay. That's interesting. And, uh, but don't let that prevent you from getting into the mechanics and making the, making the choice to go down this road. I mean, this, we, this is about for me, survival, uh, survival of ourselves, our families. And we need to do this for ourselves, for our families, for the next generation. Cause that's what really excites me is to think about when we have children and those children have children when we go that deep in terms of generations practicing the mucus's diet, that's when we're going to start to see some real, really beautiful things. And we're going to, that's when we can talk about children that have never, that don't understand what illness is that don't, that don't have any kind of disease or issues like that. It's going to take a couple generations because we've really messed ourselves up uh, and gotten ourselves way out of whack. And so we have to be patient with ourselves. We have to be loving with ourselves, and just, and, and kind of give ourselves to this process. If you're ready and you're, you know, you, you're brave enough to walk down the path, then I encourage you to, uh, you know, to give yourself to it and, and let it take you where it's going to take you. It's a, it's a beautiful journey. Professor Spira right here on Juice Guru Community. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Professor Spira. And we're going to go ahead and close out now. Oops, did I turn my camera off? And um, we're going to go ahead and close out now. Thank you guys for taking the time to be here. And remember, I'll be back tomorrow with a live workshop on becoming a certified juice therapist. We're open for enrollment in the summer at juicecrewnation.com. And we're going to tell you all about that program too. Check out Professor Spira. I'm Steve Prusak, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Juice Guru Radio. Find out more about us at JuiceGuruRadio.com. Until next time, get your juice on.